it was the most real thing that was going on in my life and it was one of the things I shared about the least. Some friends knew that something was going on but I couldn't say. I could go and I could sing in a gig but it didn't really feel like authentic expression. The creative sharing that I was still doing was being recognised and uh, given thanks for and be like, oh, you know, <laughs> come back and do another gig. <laughs> but it was feeding me less because it wasn't meeting me where I was, which was in a really, really difficult place. Gabrielle, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been very excited to dive into chatting with you. Your own work for me in researching for this interview is such a beautiful blend of photography and poetry and writing and singing and music videos and wilderness immersion and wild water swimming and I feel like I've missed a, missed, missed a couple off the list but this really amazing blend of nature and creativity and I suppose that's where I wanted to start because I've got a sense they didn't all arrive on your doorstep on the very same day, all at once. So I'm really curious, as best as you can, what inspired you to slowly incorporate all of these particular creative modalities into, into your life? Mm. Well, I would say that... Um, Nature has been um, really the heart and, and, and there from the beginning and um, always my truest inspiration and um, what feels to me like um, the most freeing reflection of myself and my experience. Um, and I do come from a very creative family and I feel really um, blessed to have been given a lot of opportunities to express myself um, from a really young age but I've had a very um, up and down is too simplistic I've had a relationship to um, what how that expression gets to be born mm -hmm. and I started writing songs when I was about seven maybe um, and then poetry came and the, my first poems were very um, devotional actually very very um, in wonder at the wild world and I sometimes I get a little bit bound up with the word nature but the things that were wild and beautiful and feral mm. uh, captured me and my my relationship with photography only really began a few years ago and um it that's that's been the key to un unlocking really my healing journey and my journey with um chronic chronic pain and um a very limited physical ability over my whole tw 20s really mm. makes a lot of sense to me that nature was there right from the start because there's a sense I really get from your content, your photography, your poetry that you're more than just standing as a detached bystander like describing it. It feels like what you're describing is the way that it ferociously moves through you and the way that you intensely and deeply experience nature so it's sort of the way that you were like oh I get a bit caught up with that word and you're immediately talking about the wild I'm like yes you're just so you're so tapped in like it's flowing through you that makes so much sense to me and actually when you mentioned the devotional, I'm going to I'm going to scroll down. I was going to talk about this a bit later, but there's a poem and I'm going to put the link below because it's so gorgeous. 
Healing the Wasteland. You've got this lovely video on, on YouTube. And there's a couple of lines in that that just really impacted me. So I'm just going to read them to you and I'd love for you to speak a little bit about them. I'm so thirsty, but too afraid to drink. I dream of pressing my cracked lips to source. I literally had a lump in my throat as I was reading that. It really speaks to me. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so that piece really, I'm already just feeling emotional, just uh, responding to your, um, your bringing it into the, the space. Um, it, that piece came through um, really at um, a very climactic point in, um, in my healing journey with my body, but also with, um, I'm going to say this, the stories that I carry and the uh, intergenerational ripples, actually. Um, I, I know that trauma is a word that is used uh, very widely now and it can mean so much. Um, but I feel them like deep ripples in in my body of the things that have come before and um, how I'm how I'm carrying them and um, that moment that I was speaking to, um, I felt so so barren. Mm -hmm. I felt um, that the journey with my the physical pain in my body and really what that was expressing from inside me um and the relationship to my inner world had left me very uh raw but i felt really dry and um it was a piece that came through uh, i don't I didn't feel like it was writer's block, but it was a time when my creative, my cre outward creative expression um, had gotten very, very quiet. And my creative eyes were turned inwards, um, looking for the source, something like a well to, to fill me with gold. I think that's another um, moment in that poem is that I was looking for um something deep and sweet to to fill me up but i was still really afraid because i wasn't done with that journey i'm still not done with that journey um and that poem really is it, i think the opening lines are about shame and my journey with my creativity that i have come through and the place that i am at now has really all been about um, old shame and that isn't serving me that was really silence I was silencing myself in the experience of that shame and um, I think it starts like what what dries us um, and what turns our tongues to blackened curls is it is it shame and it really it's like it is it, it mm. for me it is it, and it has been that shame and so to open myself to source is also to open myself to the witnessing and uh, the opening of the places that are dark and messy and really, really, really painful. And so I'm afraid, I'm afraid to open deeply to that. And I know that it's the only medicine that I really, really need. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And it means so much to me to get that broader view of the whole experience of what was behind that poem i i can really relate to that that wanting to go to those darker places or wanting wanting to have that liquid or not to be so barren to me it really fascinates me how we can be so drawn to want to express to want to be creative to 
we we've, if we've got that barrenness within us, we want to find a way to fill it up and to start to flourish once more. And I'm so interested in how that impulse can really be quite a powerful motivation for a healing journey so that we can heal the shame or the traumas that are closing that voice mm. down. What are your thoughts on, on that, this idea that creativity is almost what's pulling us out of those ancestral traumas or the developmental traumas it's it's hard to answer that call to express and to create but in doing that it's the very thing that pulls us free yeah oh um what do i think about that so much um, <laughs> I think that um, the art of create, living creatively and responding um, as a creative being, so not even really just talking about the things that we make and share, but how we respond to each moment is a creative act. It's a creative relationship. And to respond to, I've, I found that actually one of my biggest bits of work has been to be as creative and thoughtful and playful and flexible with myself where I am in each moment, each kind of unknowable hour that I don't know what the next hour holds. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know if I can walk. I don't know if I, if I can do the things that I've planned. And so that takes, for me, I think a huge amount of creativity um and so those those things that that come up um the traumas and and the things that need healing and looking at um they take they're like they're alive to me they're alive and they're, they're coming through and then they take they take a lot of um responsibility care and responsibility to tend to tend to them and um yeah to meet them mm. as they come and so the next step for me is ma is making things and giving so giving those places a voice um and that's that's really hard <laughs> not just welcoming welcoming them in and and then being present with them and creatively responding to what they're asking from the moment the places of healing and maybe trauma or but then to give them the page and be like, what do you want to say? And then to step back and not edit. Because as creatives, like, well, as a creative, I want to make beautiful things. And I know that you've spoken in other videos um, and podcast uh, sessions with people about um, how things land and being careful and caring with information and things that might be really impactful but those those voices need to just raw and keen and be how they are um first unedited mm. and that takes a lot of courage for me <laughs> yeah i I agree for, for me too. And I loved what you said about the first creative act is responding to each moment. I wanna go there first and then pick up on, on what you said later, because as I was listening to you talk about what's coming up in the moment or navigating a moment, because are you even going to be able to walk in this moment? What occurred to me is if we respond to each moment creatively, we're not responding to it with all of those historic patterns that we have inherited. Essentially, what's already been written about the moment by, by how the past says it should be. So we're sort of making sure that we're conscious in that moment and we're responding creatively, i.e. we're allowing that moment to either be what it wants to be, but we're certainly ensuring that it's not like every other moment that us and our ancestors have had coming before so I really love that that idea of 
that's the first act of creativity. And then what you say about allowing what wants to come forth to come forth without that editor, because I think, my gosh, Gabrielle, isn't that where so many of us are stuck in the creative process? Because essentially what's happening is we're reliving the censorship that we experienced as children because we've got this ancestral trauma of tone it down or that's not the correct answer or this is the way that it should look. So these creative acts are a way of relearning how to be with what wants to emerge through us. Yeah. You talk about, so I, we all, well, we might need to define it, but there's self-expression where we're expressing these, these urges, these intuitions, these imaginations. But I've also heard in, in our chats, you've talked about safe expression. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what self-expression means to you, but also the importance of safe expression. Mm. Mm. Um, I think that's something that I had to learn first with myself, um, because we've already discussed um, that kind of learned censorship. And um, we've got a lot of conditioning I think especially as women not to be uncomfortable not to rock the boat um, yeah to, to not be too wild and um, I've definitely got a lot of learned things social cultural I was very lucky to um, grow up um, as I've said before in a family that where um, just expression was safe was it it was safe to be um angry and to sing in made up languages and um yeah to to just be and um i think that's actually unfortunately quite unusual um but um some of the elements of my story and my history and some of those ripples that are in the narrative are quite stigmatized and um, taboo and um, that the expression of that hasn't been very safe for me mm. from, a, from a very young age. And so really self-expression and safe expression are for me very linked because of my story my history and it's also where um shame and creativity come into the mix because i got very um i became a real oversharer and and that's a subjective analysis because it felt actually in retrospect also um too exposing i made myself in some ways too visible as a response of being like, I will own this story. I'm going to tell you who I am, where I come from, what's happened to me, because if I just lay it out on the table, I own it. I control how it comes forward. I control when you find out and how you know, and this kind of like really controlled exposure. And um, I did the best that I could to make myself safe but I was expressing myself uh, in that way as a, as a protection so that's a kind of a bit of a paradox isn't it yeah. to, to expose myself to protect myself which has been some uh, a huge part of my creative journey to come to come back from that I don't know if I've answered your question but that's that's kind of what it means to me to mm -hmm come to a place of um, first uh, dialing it right back and um, stopping telling those stories and actually I stopped writing uh, I, I stopped everything apart from the photography and that was a new lens for me I started a new form of creativity which slightly answers a question from before of I went into that form of creative expression um, to 
start again and, and to find a new uh, a new angle, a new lens, um, to put those other things into a, a safe nest and come back to them with a different uh, from a different place. And um, I stopped writing, and I and I only I I got some professional um, holding um, in different ways, and I made a commitment to only come to some of those pots of content and those stories and those more shadow places that I was holding and that were coming out in my self-expression but also creative expression and that didn't feel that safe and I made a commitment to only meet those in really really safe pre-arranged containers where there was confidentiality it had been agreed agreed that there was non-judgment and so that I could begin taking up those strands in a different way and so that they could feed into my writing in an authentic and um, maybe more considered and careful way for, for my own emotional and mental well-being and maybe those receiving and, and hearing maybe some of the threads or even just um, even if the actual content of the story isn't coming through the flavor of how it sits in my body and how it lends to my voice and my power and um, to integrate them in a deliberate way hmm so much there Gabrielle so rich that a distinction for me is that's really hitting is where you talk about singing in another language was so accepted in your family that sort of form of self-expression where it's almost like a recognized artistic modality versus the deep communication of an inner experience that had as as you noticed a more wounded motivation like let me tell you this first before you put your own story on me and it again it, it brings me back to this phrase which has been guiding me for the last few years are we creating from truth or are we creating from trauma and to me there's no right or wrong it, it's just important to understand where where the flow is coming from yeah. and you know it sounds to me that you've got that awareness it's interesting because i read on your blog a really powerful essay on endometriosis and the you know the invisibility of that and so i sort of had that i wanted to share that because i had that in the back of my mind as you were giving this answer it was really making me think gosh so here's an experience of someone whose musical or songwriting creativity was seen and validated. But then you had the utter flip side, which is another inner truth was not seen and was not validated. And that's, that's quite different because as you say, not all of us have their creativity seen and recognized as we're growing up. So mm. it's almost, it almost makes it more extreme because you've got one impetus that's coming out of you that is believed and validated and verified, whereas you've got something else that feels very physically real to you, but is being completely overlooked. Mm. Did that, like, what did that do for your sort of way to gauge, like what is true and what is real? Um, the, the journey with having an invisible, um, condition, it's, it's partly invisible as in, um, physically, unless I can't walk or, um, um, in an, like very verbal and uncontrollable uh, amount of pain, but, um, I can cut, I can come out of one of the most harrowing experiences or flare ups. Um, and, and make my way to the shop to get something to eat and I see someone that I know and I've spent four days on morphine or and, and to be like oh you're looking so well <laughs> it's really um, it makes that it creates a huge um, space to kind of step across if I want to share mm. that experience to be like 
it it kind of makes me further away to say, well, actually, um, this is where I've been. Mm. But that um, my family and um, close friends and community are really, really supportive of my creativity and my um, my journey with chronic illness. Um, but it's it is hard to understand unless you have had um, a chronic illness or, or um, chronic pain um, and so and it's really hard to watch something that isn't acute just to go on for years and years and years and years and it's also um, yeah it uh, it's a very vulnerable feeling to be to to need to need help um, mm -hmm. and to be that debilitated and it's it's even hard for me now to talk about it and that um yeah i have to name that because for a long time uh i wasn't very honest and it brought out my pla my places of hiding um very very obviously to me i i've never really lied about things before and I and I got into a place of often lying or conceal like outright lying or white lies or con concealing from close community um, what was going on for me physically um, because it was this it was something I couldn't control and it was and it was exposing my pain and my what felt like my weakness and my dysfunctionality and my darkness or in a way that I couldn't control. And that was so challenging. Um, and I did, it was, it became the most true thing in my life to me and the, and the most ruling experience. It just, ha it had me, <laughs> like mm. just had me and, and became increasingly uh, extreme over, my, over 10 years and um, it was my most truthful thing and yet I lied about it the most or like mm. it was the most real thing that was going on in my life and it was one of the things I shared about the least um, so I g did get to a point where it was impacting my relationships because some friends knew that something was going on but I couldn't say I couldn't say but I could go and I could sing in a gig, but it didn't also, that, that didn't became, felt increasingly less real because if you're not integrating the dark things into the shiny things, they, like it didn't really feel like authentic expression. Mm. And it might still have been beautiful. It might have still been a lovely song or um, I stopped being able to dance, but um, yeah, the, the creative sharing that I was still doing was being recognised and uh, given thanks for and being like, oh, you know, <laughs> come back and do another gig. <laughs> but it was feeding me less because it wasn't meeting me where I was, which was in a really, really difficult place. Does that, does that make sense? <laughs> oh, so much sense, Gabrielle. And what you've described there really feels like a metaphor the way that you're that you were able to really explain how the biggest truth that you had in that time was the one thing that you weren't talking about and it may be that someone watching this isn't experiencing a chronic illness but my gosh if you were to just isolate that phrase yeah. how, you know how many of us would put our hands up and I also feel that that is a, a, a burden of ancestral trauma. It's like, it's wired into our DNA, this unconscious safety mechanism, possibly because like what's dropping in now is possibly because this is so vulnerable and as animals, it's like the safety alarm goes off if we're going to communicate our vulnerability. So carry, you know, walking around, as you say, or in some cases not walking around for you, 
with this big truth that you're not sharing and then you've got this veneer but ironically your veneer is this very expressive and creative singing in a gig like for other people it might be they're working in in a job that they absolutely hate that isn't creative and they're they're covering up the fact that they are a creative soul and that they live for they live for words or or art yeah it it brings me back to what you shared earlier when you talked about creativity the first act of creativity is responding to each moment and I think it was then that you talked about tending to what wants to come through and again I think this is a huge evolutionary opportunity that we're all having can we tend to ourselves in a very different way than our ancestors have done can we value the things that are emerging within us that are less about making money and survival and more about just contributing to, to beauty and awe and creativity. And I, this idea of tending was something I wanted to talk to you about because there's something that you wrote, uh, I think it was in, you did a year's volunteering at Embercombe, that the 50 acre rewilding site on, on the edge of Dartmoor. I, I've been to Embercombe, it's, it's so incredible there. And, um, I just want to come to this piece, Gabrielle, because it really, it really spoke to me and it sort of brings us back to nature, which is what you said right at the very start was, was there for you. So this is from, I think it's from a blog post that's on their website rather than your own blog. So I'm just going to read a few lines so that the people watching know what we're talking about. I've seen hard frosts. Oh, let me just give some context. So you're you're basically you've gone to Embercombe, this fifty acres site that's being rewilded, and you're living in a caravan. Okay, so that that's the context with, with chronic illness. And with chronic illness, <laughs> barely able to walk. It was beautiful. <laughs> I've seen hard frosts cloaking the slopes of the land in white. Heard the wind whistling through the cracks in my caravan and chopped kindling late at night because I've forgotten I need it to keep the chill from my toes. I've carried water and thermoses of hot tea across the fields and sat in bed with a cup of it steaming as the moon rises. This practical tending of needs grounded me and began to smooth my edges. So this has a beautiful context now that we've had this conversation so i'd love for you to share a bit more but what i'm sort of layering is like wow first we can first we sort of reprogram ourselves to tend to our needs and then we can tend to our creativity and also what i'm getting is just how healing that simple tending is because as you said when you were in that caravan and i think you mentioned in that post that your nervous system was raw panic attacks were a really common occurrence so can you tell us a little bit about what that tending gave to you what that experience in nature was like yeah absolutely it was it was a really special time for me um and and challenging because I knew mm. going into it that I was because I had already six months of that year was in deep relationship to that piece of land but I was living in a house about 20 minutes away so I I knew what what I was going into and I was really reaching for um, reaching for some for, for for some deep holding from the land and it was the best way that I could have that with the means that I had financially, time-wise. Um, and yeah, it was really raw. It wasn't very long ago, it was about two years ago. And um, and I, I needed quiet. I really, really needed quiet. And I started um, a noise and light pollution detox i had um yeah just a tiny uh, solar um set of fairy lights in in the caravan and i was in a beautiful 1940s vintage caravan so it was really uh had a lot of character but it was um cold 
very cold i sometimes so i was there i also chose a not amazing time <laughs> to move in in january and um i went to bed with just wrapped like in gloves i went to bed with slippers on <laughs> and and i had to tend the fire I had to get up at three o'clock in the morning to tend the fire mm -hmm. and um those very very simple acts of being like okay so my job is here on this land i live here and I'm going to see these seasons turn. I'm get, gonna be so close. I was in an apple orchard and I watched every single moment of change in the blossom and how it, and when it turned into fruit. And then I went back and I picked that fruit. And, um, and I found my way back to um, the real grounded, minute, details and, and intimacy of the wild and um, the lessons of the wild of rest and um, to come back from nervous system overload and um, to have begun taking I had already begun taking lids off of pots big pots the the pots with all of the stuff in <laughs> and i'd started taking those lids off and they and it was an incredibly necessary process but um it's like it's like i my body was an instrument and that i do see the your the the body as a vessel of um creative flow it's a tool and an instrument and it's a musical analogy which maybe is fitting but i felt strummed <laughs> angrily like my my strings were vibrating and mm. i arrived on onto the land and they'd asked me to to take a lot of pictures and so i was looking at the land looking for beauty i was witnessing the land coming alive and i you don't have to look far that all the mm. land is beautiful but i was really really close and soaking in the beauty and there isn't really m medicine like it and also what comes to me is the way that we interact or we partake in that medicine because this medicine's around us, but if we're rushing through it, then we're not going to receive what it can do for us. And it's almost like it's in the taking of it. So it's not like we take a pill and then the pill kind of works without our focus. It just goes, it's like, it's, it's the consuming of nature, the witnessing of it, the watching of it. So the taking of it is like, I took medicine for 10 hours today versus I just put, you know, I popped a pill and then it continued to work for 10 hours because I think it is allowing yourself to see that slow unfolding. And I know what it's like, my goodness, when my nervous system is all flared up, it's the hardest thing to do to watch the wind blowing through the leaves in, in a tree because either I will be so restless, I'll, I'll find a gazillion things to do or I will be watching or like my head will be turned in the right direction and my eyes will be there, but I won't be seeing it because I'm so consumed by my thoughts. So those are the two things that I have to watch out for when I'm so flared up and I'm in such a heightened state of activation. Yeah. It can take me a long, long time to get back to a way of being in nature that allows me to benefit from the medicine. Yeah. It's, it's being close to nature for long periods of time so that when you have the capacity to be present and it is the taking but I was suddenly struck by actually it's reciprocity with because it's it's um responding and relating and being in this um in the in a give and take that's you can't see the beginning and you can't see the end and it's it's a flow backwards and forwards of um what have I got to give back and in the witnessing and the loving of the land is that a gift because 
because it's uh, it goes without saying that we receive we receive from mm. being i mean there's all sorts of scientific studies and you know about what ha what happens to your brain chemistry um when your feet are on the earth um but it's in it's in the act of going and making habitats and <laughs> singing into the tree singing to the wildflowers and mm. and giving thanks that um i think space is made for um for you to be truly receptive rather than just an observer to be mm. to be one with and and intimately relating yeah that's lovely and also for me that's when i really do experience my my body as that vessel or that instrument that you mentioned earlier when i've spent conscious time in nature the words that i'm then moved to put down on the page it feels like just the shapes and sounds of something moving through me and it's it takes it takes a certain skill set that i think i've developed where i can feel the sensation of something moving through me and then slowly tend to that sensation and then give it words yeah. uh, i know it's different for everyone i know some people will literally just have words flowing through them but for me it's a great amount of lovely sensation which i then have to just tend to very slowly and, and put the words to mm. Let me come to another little bit that you shared about um, nature, because I think this is really important. I certainly know that the old me might have been listening to this conversation and be like, oh, these two women, they're so perfectly aligned with nature. They live nature. They're wild. And without sort of getting a glimpse that, no, no, it's like a day. It's a daily practice. It's a daily reminder. And we can fall off that wagon. So I want to just share something that you that you put, because I know that on one of your Instagram posts, you talk about nature being um, the only medicine that's consistently brought you relief from that pain. But also we can forget that. And I'm just going to come back to it where uh, this quote that you put, um, yeah, so it was last winter, a post, really vulnerable post on Instagram where you shared about your womb surgery and you shared that you had spiralled a little yeah. and you talked about being introverted and quiet. It sort of reminds me of the word barren that you that you said earlier, but actually I think sometimes we, ne you know, we need that. We need that time to come in just like that season of winter there's a lot going on under the earth that we can't see we sort of need that um you said that you journeyed through the cold for quite a long time but that you were making your way back and in the same post you put the problem is i don't always remember to take my own biggest medicine but when i get into a wild wet day on the moors and take off my boots breathe i thaw it's simple so can you talk to us a little bit about what happens when you forget to take your medicine? Because <laughs> um, I think sometimes, well, it's so easy to see, you know, gurus and spiritual teachers and think, well, they never fall off the wagon. But I always say it's not that we don't fall off the wagon. It's just that we can get back on again when, when you know, when we've probably gotten very good at getting back on because we've fallen off so many times. Well, in my case. So can you talk to us a little bit about what happens when you forget, if you can sort of almost track through in slow motion, what is it that causes you to forget and how do you get back on the wagon? How do you get back out into the wild and take your boots off again? Thank you, Gabriella. I do, I do think it's really important to, um, to acknowledge the days when you don't write even though you know you need to and um and to share because i think so social media can get very um 
toxic positivity mm. um, and sort of to just talk about the good days. Um, what does it look like? I think um, it's related to what we were talking about earlier about how we know that we need to open up and to look at the difficult things but it's work it it um it's not the easy route but it's the most rewarding one and mm. um having a daily practice takes discipline and um we know it's for our benefit and it's really cold in the river <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and it was really difficult after my surgery just on a, on a physical level because my incision sites took longer than planned to heal and mm. so also catching um, the turning of the seasons is really useful when you're getting into very cold water because otherwise you're going from a very depleted and fragile place, you're just getting in at the darkest and coldest bit of the year. And it's like a kind of sneaky, sliding kind of, oh, I will later. And then it's three days later. Oh, um, yeah I will tomorrow and then it it's this not showing up for myself it's um it's about self-care it's about um the longer it becomes the body memory of how good I feel and how alive I feel and how much more connected and in a creative flow I feel just gets I can't I can't feel it and it's like this wall comes up of like, I can, I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear the river from where I'm sitting. That's how embarrassing it is. It's so close. I could almost throw a stone into the river dart. I'm so close mm. to that incredible body of water. And I didn't do it for months mm. and months. I just kind of retreated into myself and the more I, it's like a it's, it's one of those cycles isn't it it's the more the more it happens the more it happens the more it's and this is what's going on in my body I'm just retreating from the discomfort of um it's like a muscle of like opening to creative flow and opening to connection to the wild and to myself and what sometimes I get out of the river and I cry because it's opened up a stagnant place that it's the the elemental power of the river can do something that I can't do on my own it's a supportive friend that goes hey what's going on you're really sticky today and I'm like oh yeah I'm really sticky and then I let it go um but it's uncomfortable mm. oh I just I really want to celebrate that share. <laughs> I mean, to me, I, f I really do truly feel that these shares are the most important because there's so much content out there about five tips for this and two steps for that. But actually, what so many of us want to hear is that we all get stuck. We all get stuck and how long we spend in that place of stuckness can then be magnified because we feel ashamed about how long we're spending in that place of stuckness that shame oh my gosh and we we touched on that earlier yeah. and that to me is i do have a sense that that shaming of ourselves is a very maladaptive habit at one point shaming ourselves might have given us a bit of a kick up the butt but if we've done it for so long, for me, that shaming, it just puts me into a shutdown state. My nervous system just totally, mm. um, I, I go into freeze. Mm. So 
and then it doesn't matter if that it doesn't matter if I'm literally lying beside the river no maybe if I was lying beside the river I might just kind of be able to like roll into it <laughs> but for me like you say that river is so accessible to you for me it's I have a breathwork practice that no matter where I am it will take me on a rocket to the divine <sighs> And the practice is 55 minutes. Yeah. So I can go a few days where I know that I have forgotten my connection with the divine. And I'm like, 55 minutes, my love. And I think, I'm too busy today. If only that practice were five minutes. And then as soon as I do it, but as you say, if the, if the space in between is more than a few days, the discomfort grows and you forget I forget what it feels like to be on speed dial with the divine and I feel I feel forsaken and I think what if it doesn't work this time I think that's a great fear of mine what if it doesn't work this time for me there's also there there is a resistance to self-love because mm. to do the things that I need to do is a commitment to myself and to showing up and um and that that resistance is all around. I see it all around. I know I'm not alone with it. I know that I'm not the only person that is um, learning how to say my love, <laughs> get in the river, <laughs> um, you know, drink, mm. some, drink some water and have a cry. Get, get yourself moving um, and allow something, allow something beautiful to come. And it might also be painful and it might also be ugly, but just allow it. Um, and it seems it seems like such a no brainer, doesn't it? When you're looking on the outside of someone else's journey, it can be like, oh, I've so been there. Or it can be like, what are you doing? All you need to do is <laughs> love yourself, <laughs> take care yeah. of yourself, get in the river and breathe. Yes, thanks for bringing that self-love piece in because I think it's almost like that's why it compounds because when we fall into those ruts, that conditioned way of thinking is not particularly self-loving and to do some wild swimming, cold water swimming or a 55 minute breathwork practice, the person who does those things are, is 100% committed to their truth and the source within them but if you've lost connection with that then that key motivation is gone and connection um love and connection i i am so obsessed with Brene brown's work about vulnerability and shame and that shame shame breaks down love and connection mm. shame shame interrupts your ability to feel connected because you're like oh that person doesn't hasn't seen how ugly it is in there and how dark it is in there so how can they know me how can they truly love me and so you, so there's this this barrier between you and connection um and mm. the 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 whole practice with the river and the photography and it brought my words back from that barren place that i was in that journey is all about self-love and mm. um, the lens, the lens of the camera, but also the tool of it. Um, I started getting into the water and it began, the water began before the photography, but the photography, particularly underwater, but just in the water and in the wild, um, I took my clothes off because I had stripped the layers from those inner places um, and I, I had gotten myself down to something painful and authentic and I was working my way into how I can accept the real shape of me and I took myself to the place that I find the most beautiful the most honest and the most pure and I worked at and it was just for me for so long it was and it still is it's just for me to 
and I and I work with other people too, but it's to see the human form in all its simple, flawed beauty as being utterly one and non-separate from the elemental wild. To to see the flow of the river and the swell of the hill and hip and eye and elbow and skin and it wasn't sexual, it was about the sensuality of life to find something both pleasurable and simple when my body wasn't feeling pleasurable or simple it was feeling very limited very challenging and the inner difficult places that were coming up um i needed to find um gentleness and and um acceptance of of those and so that was that was one of my workarounds into those places of shame is to get very very simple and to um to use the lens to convince myself that i saw the river and the tree and the rock and the bird um in my own body mm. this is really feeling like a very powerful riff on being seen we've got if i'm not loving myself i'm not i'm not seeing myself as i truly am i'm looking at myself through um condi you know conditional eyes i'm not giving myself an unconditional gaze and those images they're so gorgeous and we'll put your instagram below they truly are uh it just seems like capturing and uncovering the self as something that's so magical because we've got the way the body can be in water which is so different to how it can be on land like the shapes the suspension and then you've got the lovely colors of some of the garments that you wear you've got the images where you are as you say you're just naked and then you've got the playfulness with the colors and the garments so what I feel when I look at these images is a real sense of invitation to see the body, as you say, as something natural, wild, magical, flowing, elemental. Yeah, and that, you know, if we come from how trauma can really condition a fear of being seen, yeah. Let, perhaps let's sort of end on on that kind of reflection how how would you say that journey has been we've got a fear of being seen or how trauma might create that fear or give us that fear and how that might manifest coming all the way through to allowing your creativity to show you truly how to see yourself I I don't know that I really know anyone who wasn't um, challenged by being deeply, deeply seen. We long for it deeply, long to be known, to be witnessed and uh, to be welcomed in the whole of who we are and I feel like um, creative offerings are um, are a distillation of voice, um, and and your gift, my gift, your gift. Um, and I can only speak for myself um, to say that this work that I have done has brought me to a place where I am beginning new work that feels like it's spoken with my whole body. But the work isn't done, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> and and it's, um, it's a dynamic relationship. 
that um, like the practice of being in the water needs an eye kept on it and I'm not there yet and I don't know that there is a there to get to <laughs> but I am in relationship and I commit to that relationship and I I'm going to do my best to walk the incredibly delicate and tricky line between writing for myself singing for myself and um, where that becomes writing the stories that just need to be told that um, mm. and the stories that need to be heard um, mm. and trying to get to, trying to be in a very kind relationship to um, the fear of being seen that is going to come from early early experiences of feeling like what I have to say isn't safe or whatever has happened to me or anyone that feels that sense of locking down um, to be really kind and um, not let it rule the show <laughs> to welcome it to be to have have the voice be in the space but not not to, to take over and say that it's not safe to to show up with the whole story um, so what I would leave it where I would leave it is I would say um, to reassure you I am very much just gonna keep working <laughs> and anyone who is listening um, it's not a straight line <laughs> and it's a dynamic ever-evolving um, journey that's gonna look different day to day Beautiful. Mm. Gabrielle, this has been really so gorgeous to speak with you. Um, yeah, I really feel that, feel that in my heart too. Such a, such a beautiful connection and I've really felt really moved and uplifted with where you're at on your path and just what you're sharing. Um, and I continue to, well, I like the idea of continuing to follow and see how you evolve. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Kevin.